All right. So everybody see this okay? Yeah, just okay. Okay. So for the case presentation today, uh, I'm going to talk about a case uh, on the general neurology service a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is a 23 year old female, uh, very healthy, uh, just had a mild COVID symptom early August uh, and had just a couple of days of runny nose and mild URI symptoms, complete recovery uh, in a couple of days, and then was doing fine for two, three weeks and she developed nausea, vomiting and fever um, and went to the outside hospital two, three weeks later with uh, acute onset encephalopathy, dysarthria and sort of generalized weakness. Uh, on presentation to outside hospital, her vital signs were uh, noted to be unremarkable. And initial exam there, uh, they mentioned dysarthria, generalized weakness, and uh, as notable for hyperreflexia in her lower extremities and ataxia on finger to nose and uh, difficulty with gait. Initial labs, uh, she tested positive again for COVID on admission, uh, mild hyponatremia, UDS positive for cannabinoids. And CSF studies were uh, unremarkable, no uh, signs of infection. So they got an MRI after that, uh, which showed this. So this is a arrow sign pointing to the uh, splenium of the corpus callosum. You see uh, diffusion restriction there, very symmetric with the ADC correlate. Uh, I didn't include the um, uh, contrast study, but uh, there was no contrast enhancement with this uh, lesion. She also had some uh, bilateral diffusion restriction in the uh, uh, centrum semio valley uh, with ADC correlate. Again, this had no contrast enhancement. Um, so this group of uh, imaging findings is known as the uh, cytotoxic lesion of the corpus callosum, uh, CLOCC. And uh, it is character by, characterized by imaging findings of uh, restrict diffusion of the uh, corpus callosum, as the name suggests, without any contrast enhancement, usually very midline and symmetric. And there's three patterns. There's one where it's a small round lesion in the middle of the splenium. And then second type is uh, what we see here, lesion centered around this uh, splenium and extending into the colossal fibers. And there's also more extensive one where it starts posterior and then extends into the anterior corpus callosum. There's lots of uh, different etiologies documented for this condition, uh, drugs, malignancy, infection, hemorrhage, uh, anything really you can think of that sort of uh, disturbs the uh, humor of the body. Uh, so in this case, we uh, attribute to uh, COVID-19 infection and sort of an inflammatory response after that. And there are, there's actually a couple of documented cases of that now past couple of years uh, for uh, due to COVID. Um, and it is sort of hypothesized that corpus callosum has a higher density of glutamate and cytokine receptors. So anytime there is a sort of systemic inflammation going on, that area is very susceptible to cytotoxic edema. Um, and they also noted uh, sort of higher density of toxin receptors and drug receptors in this area as well. Um, so since there's no um, uh, sort of infectious signs on the CSF, uh, the, 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 I guess, uh, expert opinion now is to treat with a course of IV steroids. So she received five doses of high dose uh, methylpred. And this is the MRI after uh, the course of steroids. You see almost complete resolution of the diffusion restriction in the areas with, uh, that we saw earlier. And uh, her symptoms didn't recover completely, but she was um, very much improved from her admission and she was discharged uh, after uh, to rehab after just one week of stay here after completing the steroids. Uh, so hopefully given her young age and sort of other case reports, she will continue improvement and uh, achieve full recovery. All right. Wonderful. So it's a call clock. Yeah, it's called clock. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. I call it CLOCC, but... Uh, it's one of those, uh, yeah, that clock. So when, when, when Justin and I went over it before, I, I told him that it, it was both a name and a description, right? It sounds like it's a thing, but it's just a description, right? It's, it's not actually a name of what's going on, but who, who would have thought, right? Amazing. And it usually doesn't always end that well on neurology, Doug, just in case. Uh... <laughs> Will, do I hit okay? So uh, I'm going to introduce today's uh, speaker. No slides, Will. Uh, Dr. Uh, Doug 
Marchuk. I, I, I uh, became aware of Doug when I was at the Stroke Symposium that was on a Saturday at the James B. Duke that Wayne was part of organizing. And I remember Alan Friedman uh, was talking and he talked about how kind of insular Duke is and how you get lost in your own, own world. And he said, it was only by going to Woods Hole in the summer that he learned that Duke had the most important vascular geneticist in the world. And he would learn what Doug had been working on that year. But like in the hurly burly of the day to day, you don't even realize that. So I asked Doug to uh, come speak to us today because he's also a superb uh, speaker. He grew up in Ohio, uh, went to the University of Dayton, and then got his PhD from the University of Chicago, where he studied, of all things, keratin, right? That was a thing in those days, right? Because there was so much of it. And uh, came to Duke in 1993, where he's been ever since. He is the, currently the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. He's also the director of the Duke Program for Genetics and Genomics, and the director of the Center for Experimental Genetics. His, I mean, I don't need to tell you about his work. His talk is, I hate to put the pressure on, but his talk's going to be fantastic. <laughs> and his title today is Cerebral Cavernous Malformations, The Roads from Gene to Therapy. So Doug, take it away. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, I'll just walk away. <laughs> oh, um, I gotta load my presentation back up, okay. and then I'll share. Well, this is really touchy. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Rich, for that introduction. Um, I'll try to fulfill that. Um, uh -huh. There we go. All right. Oh, that this is still in there. I don't know if I can move that. Well, okay. So. Um, I'm going to tell you an odyssey of how we've used human genetics to sort of tackle this cerebral cavernous malformation story. This actually is a 31 year odyssey. It actually started when I was a postdoc um, in, in Michigan and, um, and this continued. That's not the right way to do it. Let's move the mic. Let's get this out of here. There we go, okay, I got it. So, so I've actually, I, I don't know that I'm the, the world's expert, but um, I, I, I have been studying for a quite a long time these vascular malformation syndromes. And um, we've either in collaboration with others or ourselves identified here, here at Duke, just in the Carl building, identified the genes causing a lot of these diseases and we've then studied them and we found these genes and I'm not gonna talk all about this, but you know, many of these things were either unknown or or you know, uh, kind of novel proteins. Others were very well known, some in, in the BPM, uh, BMP signaling complex, et cetera. So then, and we've made mouse models. I'm not gonna talk about anything except for the human genetics part, and I'm gonna focus on the cerebral cavernous malformation. So these are these vascular malformations in the CNS. They're the, they, they turn out to be these clusters of dilated vessels, and they have this defective endothelial cell junction. And um, they're actually quite common on, on autopsy, review, you can see that, you know, people may have one or so, a few of these, but um, they um, have a lifetime risk of hemorrhage, epilepsy, and these neurological outcomes because of that leaky barrier. This is a pathology slide, oops, and you can see this, it, what's called the mulberry, my, my, some of my clinical colleagues, neurosurgery colleagues call it the mulberry appearance. And they say it's like a mulberry for two reasons. One is because you see the little encapsulated vessels, but the other point is, is that they're very leaky. And, and if you surgically remove that, you can see that they're very, they're very sensitive to breakage. And they show up on MRI. And, and what we knew about that was that there were both sporadic and inherited forms. 
And the inherited form was where we decided to tackle first because we had a genetic window into the process. And um, they have are their autosomal dominance, so they're inherited from generation to generation, males and females, but with reduced penetrance. And it turns out, and I'm going to show a slide in a minute, that the reduced penetrance is primarily due to clinically silent cases. That is cases where the lesions are present in the brain, but the symptoms uh, are not yet uh, happening. And, and th there's a classic paper by Rigamonte in New England Journal of Medicine in 98. And what, what he did was he took the proband of a family, a very large Hispanic family, Mexican-American family, and he brought everybody in and did an MRI. Now, not everybody was symptomatic and you wouldn't probably normally do that, but he showed that it was autosomal dominant. And, um, and then the MRI imaging is critical to assign proper status in, in a, in a genetic study because you need to know who has and who doesn't. And with advanced MRI modalities, the penetrance is essentially 100% by adulthood. You, you can always see these in the, the brain. So, so what did we do? Well, we, we collected families like the one I just showed you there and many others. And we, in a couple labs about the same time, identified the region of chromosome seven where this gene, original gene needed uh, presumably light. And I, I don't want to talk about genetic linkage analysis because it's now almost mundane, although I will say that, that now you just say, well, just sequence it and see what you find. But linkage plus linkage will give you an approximate region, and then it narrows the search space, and it's really actually very useful, even, even in this modern era of genome sequencing. So again, this was before genome sequencing, so how can the gene be identified? And, and what we did was we went back to some of those Mexican-American families, because Dr. Rigamonte, I believe at the time was in the Phoenix, Arizona area, but it was known that there, were, there was a familial aggregation in um, Mexican-American families. And when, when uh, Leslie Morrison, who was a neurologist at the University of New Mexico, she helped us collect a number of families. And we got some from the Barrow Neurological Institute, which is in Arizona, and, and a few other families that, that were not Mexican-American. And what we found was that those Mexican-American families that were not to their knowledge related to each other when, and there was no evidence that they were in fact, but when we looked very close in the region of chromosome seven, where we knew the gene had to lie, they had genetic fingerprint that looked the same. So you're going along chromosome seven, all of a sudden you get to this region well, that we know by recombination breakpoints that, that the gene has to be somewhere in this huge region. Then all of a sudden the DNA has the similar fingerprint on the affected chromosome, and that's haplotype analysis. And, and that's just shown here. These markers are microsatellite markers. You probably don't remember that, but, but they have a certain length because they're, they're a certain sequence, but embedded in that sequence is CA, 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 and, and it, it expands and contracts over uh, evolutionary time. And you can see that all of this is the affected chromosome of family number 10, 11, 12, and then the numbers change because we got them from different people, uh, different uh, collaborators. Some are from New Mexico, some from Phoenix, and, and it was the same haplotype. So that tells you a couple of things. One is those are ancestral crossovers. Crossovers maybe four to five, six, seven generations back, but they tell you, okay, all of a sudden you can narrow down. Well, the gene, instead of being way over here, like on the whole state of uh, North Carolina, maybe, well, maybe it's in you know, Durham County. And then, and then you start to get, oh, I can get the street level. So we started to get closer and closer to the gene. And, and remember, there was no sequence. So what we did was we just started giving them markers. So we were one of the first groups, by the way. Here's how the genome, human genome project happened in the public effort anyways. They didn't start on one, chromosome one and go to the end you got to nominate a region of biomedical interest, and then they started there if you could give them clones to then expand and sequence. So we did that, the sequence was deposited in the public database, and then we pulled it out. And then we found this gene, and it was interesting because we started to find mutations. The, if, if you look at this, this is a deletion of five nucleotides, a deletion of two, this is a splice site right at the canonical splice junction. X means a stop codon, stop codon, et cetera. So these are loss of function mutations. These are clear mutations. And we found it in this gene. And what was important was all those Mexican-American families had the exact same mutation. So not only did the fingerprint look the same, but they had the exact same mutation. And now we know that this is a founding mutation that maybe happened four or 500 years ago. And, and the entire biomedical literature on this gene and protein was one paper, and they, they named it CRIT, CREV Interaction Trap 1, because they did a yeast 2 hybrid with something called CREV. The, the more common name, though, is RAP1A. And they pulled out this, and so they called it CRIT Interaction tra uh, Trap 1. So the protein function was completely unknown. 
So my postdoc, Trina Lukensahu, um, started to try to um, do protein biochemistry and some cell biology of this. And he said, I can't make the protein. And I said, do we really know that that's the whole protein? And you notice I'm starting in an exon eight because what happened was in those early days of the database, they just found some something in the cDNA and they did it. We, we did a combination, you know, they, they put it in the database, but what we did was we did do it. There's the previous start code and then the first exon. We did a combination of five prime races. We kept looking toward the other end with cDNA cloning and PCR tricks and stuff. And we found four new coding exons, 200 and I have it here somewhere, I thought, 208 new amino acids. We actually, we actually used um, exon prediction programs to show that these were deceived to be real exons. There were cDNAs in different species, mus musculus, mouse, but also in human. And, and that new start codon, then we were really concerned, are we, do we really have the end? And sure enough, if you look at different species, that new first exon is completely conserved, and then behind it, it, it just falls away. So I told Sahu what would seal the deal is if we could find a mutation in those new exons and one of our families that we didn't find it. There it is right there. So, so we had some non, we had quite a few, in fact, non-Hispanic um, families and, and there, there was a frame shift five base pair, four base pair deletion. So anyways, there it is, it's 207 extra amino acids. And then we, and we and others then began to do the biochemistry. And that's not so much what I'm gonna talk about, except to say that in the meanwhile, people had noticed that there were other linkage groups. That is, there, there, there were some families that not, not only did not have a mutation in this gene, but were mapping to other regions in the genome by linkage analysis. And, and, I, and so I want you to focus on this. Remember, nothing was known about this region and it doesn't have any, these are called anchor domains that are involved in protein-protein interactions. And this firm domain is the uh, uh, sort of a Azrin, Redexin, Moise, and it's, it's like a membrane kind of, spanning, uh, not spanning, but a uh, interaction domain. So what John did, a grad student lab, was he took that new region that nobody knew about, and he went back, just like Eric Galimus had first found CRIT by using a yeast 2 hybrid, which is an interaction trap uh, genetic trick. He did the yeast 2 hybrid on the new stuff, on the new region, just that new region, saying, well, what can else, because we already knew that the back end bound RAP1A. So, and he pulled out this thing called ICAP1. And he did some biochemistry and, and some really nice work on that. But I wanna focus on the molecular, bio, uh, the genetics here was, we noticed that in, we're still in the early days of the genome project. And we knew again, an approximate region on, a, on chromosome seven, a different, re, the complete other arm of, of chromosome seven, that gene had to be in this broad region of millions and millions of base pairs. But there was something in that region that looked identical to CRID. I'm sorry, to, to ICAP, the thing that he pulled out. And you know about the yeast 2 hybrid, if, if, if a protein has a domain that's interacting with your bait, it will interact, it's kind of promiscuous, even if it's not the right thing, because it, it can. And so we said, gosh, that's interesting. This actually had the entire biomedical literature of zero papers. In fact, it had no name. It was called MGC4607. It was a gene name because they saw there's a transcript that maps here and there's some exons. And so we had a postdoc in the lab doing the human genetics on this, trying to find the other genes. And she said, why don't you sequence that? Sure enough, that new thing, MGC4607 was the new gene. And again, you can see uh, <clears throat> splice site mutations and uh, uh, various, uh, Splice, again, splice site mutations, stop codons, et cetera. So these are clear loss of function mutations and that was the second gene. There's some more down there. Uh, the third gene was found um, by Tournée Lesevre in France. It's a really interesting story why we missed it. This is the most severe form. And in fact, until recently, there weren't too many families. And so when she found the gene and published it, we went back and it was all in our sporadic cases, the cases where we had no family history. And if you think about it, very, very severe forms of disease don't lend themselves, even if they're autosomal dominant, they don't lend themselves to passing through many generations in large families because early on the people died before reproductive age. That's true. And so all of our patients were de novo mutations, um, essentially all of them. That is, they were the first in, they were the first to get the mutation because it was either in the sperm or the egg. Anyways, so, and that's what I just said. So I'll skip that long slide. So I want to tell a little bit of story about two more ancestral founder mutations because it's kind of like a, 
um, I'm a human geneticist, sorry. So, but but it, it, it tells a little story of how these mutations can spread through population groups. The first we're gonna talk about is this Ashkenazi Jewish mutation. We have not sequenced a patient in probably 20 years because it's done in the, yeah, maybe 15, because it's in the diagnostic labs now. And there's a, there, there, uh, there's a patient advocacy group for this disease and they sort of funnel most of the patients in the United States anyways, to this uh, company called Prevention Genetics. They have a relationship and they sequence. And then uh, Jim Weber, who's the president comes back and he presents, well, this is what we're finding. And he was in, uh, I was at a meeting and he was saying, well, yeah, you know, we found this weird mutation, but it, I can't call it a mutation in seven different families. And they, and all of them checked the box, you know, of ethnicity, Jewish. And then, um, but, but he didn't call it a mutation. And here's why, if you've ever, stared at mutation data. You know, here's the canonical GT, the others, this is exon one, so, but the next exon, you'd have an AG and GT on each end. It's over here, it's two base changes. This GC is the TT. It could affect splicing. How, but remember, this is the first exon. So how do you, you can, if you screw this up, you don't get a transcript, it doesn't miss splice, it doesn't work. So you can't really find a, a, an alternative splice variant. But so he never called it a mutation. So I, I listened to Jim at the meeting. I said, Jim, we'll figure this out. So the first thing we did was we looked at those families and we started to collect those, not the individual people who came in for testing, but we expanded those to families. They're not very large, but we could see that these erstwhile unrelated Ashkenazi Jewish families in this region have the same DNA fingerprint. So again, a story of an ancestral, possibly deep-rooted mutation in the Jewish population. But we still couldn't prove that it was a mutation. So what we did, what we did was, and this is going to be a little convoluted, but there's an alter. So here's this exon. You can't skip exon one because it's required. But there's another exon that's rarely used. We call it alternate exon one. And what we found was that the, if the, the mutations were in linkage to equilibrium with a single nucleotide polymorphism in exon two, so this is acting as a surrogate for the mutation. And um, I forgot it's the G or the A, it doesn't matter. Because the point is, is that when we took these patients and we got some tissue, got RNA, and when, the, when you look, when you do RT-PCR and you look at the transcript coming from this alternate exon, you see both alleles. And that's shown right here. But on the affected, when you go from this exon to that exon and you use these PCR primers, you only see one allele, okay? So what's happening here is that we can see that 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 one allele is missing. Now, is it in, and we could also tell that it was because we knew LD, it was the allele that had the mutation. So I always tell people in the lab, I hate evidence of something by the absence of something. So we've proved this is mutation because we can't find something. And I don't like that. So we had to figure out a way to prove that this caused misplicing, even though technically, again, it just gets degraded because you can't skip exon one. So what we did was we made a hybrid exon. We faked them out because exon one doesn't have a splice site on the front end. We just, we just created a new exon from an exon two of a completely different gene, jammed it together with this exon one. And I'll just cut to the chase. When you do that, you get an alternative splice. It, it, it misplices. And so not that this has anything to do with reality in terms of the fact that, that, that this exon doesn't exist. This is a completely hybrid exon. But the point is, is we've shown that this causes misplacing. So now this is called the Ashkenazi Jewish family. And in a genetic testing, if a person checks the box for being Jewish, they don't sequence all three genes that I told you about. They look for this one mutation first. The chances are extremely high that they'll have it. And then, of course, it's a pretty cheap test that way. The same is holds true for the Hispanic mutation. You don't, they, if, you, if you have an Hispanic surname and you say that you're Mexican American, they'll, they'll usually just look for that one mutation and, you know, nine times out of 10, whatever, they'll, they'll, they'll find it. So one more story was we were missing a lot of mutations um, by our, when, this is backwards now a little bit in, in, in history. Uh, when we were sequencing, we realized that, you know, th these are loss of function mutations. That is, it's killing the protein, so it's killing the gene. And one way to do that is to have large deletion, which, by the way, don't show up in sequencing. So we started to do some ligation PCR tricks that are, are able to identify deletions, and we started to find deletions in our missing mutations. And in, 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 in this is just one gene, CCM2. But what was interesting was, you know, here's a patient with deleting exon one, this patient with exon two, this one three. We found a bunch of patients that had the identical huge deletion of 77K, 77.6 kilobases, and it deleted this whole gene, uh, this whole, essentially the whole gene minus exon one. And when we looked really carefully, well, because this seems like it's recurring over and over again, 
we looked and sure enough, there were ALU repeats, you know, these are repetitive elements, the, the DNA is literally, our genomes are littered with these things, hundreds of thousands. Of them. And yet, and you see here the, the SG, SG, the, there were two different ALU classes that had come together in recombination site. And, and when we sequenced the recombination breakpoint and everybody looked identical. So this could be the fact that this is a highly recombinogenic region and these people keep appearing randomly, or maybe this is another founder case. And, and this lied dormant for a long while. And then that was published in 2007. And um, the diagnostic lab started look. We, we created a piece, we, we generated a PCR test. You PCR across the, the deletion is too large. But if you put your primers on the outside of the deletion, the only people who would ever give you a PCR, tiny little PCR product, the people with the deletion, because then that's only like a couple hundred base pairs. And they use that all the time. And then the, the president of the foundation called me up and said, you know, 10% or 15, whatever she said, 10, 15% of the patients in the United States have that one deletion, that one mutation. Oh, that's weird. And she says, and I can predict that they're going to have it depending on what geographical region they come from. And I was like, whoa. So she said, we found 19 more families with that just, in, and, and they keep coming, but that, that was the case. And so what we did was then we, this is animation. I'm missing something, but that's okay. What we did was we did a PCR trick to sequence across the, the boundaries, the deletions here, if all of a sudden it's gone, you can go across into new DNA. And those people had the same sequence, what's called the same haplotype all the way across. So all 19 plus the seven, everybody had the same sequence surrounding that. Again, and the fingerprint is identical. 27 of 27 probands. And this, and it's never been reported in Europe or the UK and, um, so meanwhile, the foundation started to uh, investigate this. They actually created a private Facebook page and they were all communicating. And pretty soon we had broken down these 27 families to possibly not five big kindreds that presumably are also related, but they're, they're still working on that. We, we got a family, they got a family history library uh, from uh, Salt Lake City involved and a professional genealogist. So anyways, what we found was that this thing probably originated in like, you know, 1600s in colonial Virginia is before the, you know, our country was a, a country, it was still a colony. And it seems to have spread out. And of course, people move and migrate, but a lot of the families are from there. But, um, but it's, it, it, it's now published. Um, sorry, sis. Yeah. So anyways, those are the three founder mutation stories I wanted to tell. Let's get back to some biology. How do these mutations result in discrete focal lesions? Remember that every cell in your body has whatever mutation you inherited, and yet these deletions are very specific. Uh, these focal lesions, these cerebral cavernous malformations are very focal. And in fact, so a clue, yeah, every, all my sort of take home points are on the top there, but a clue comes from the epidemiology of the disease. I told you that it comes in sporadic and familial forms, and the sporadic forms no family history, no genetic mutation are almost a single solitary lesion. So here's an MRI image. And they have certain clinical outcomes. But the main point is, is that the autosomal dominant forms often are associated with a huge number of lesions. Look at this, this is a, amazing. And, and, and we have patients in our, our larger data, I'm part of this brain vascular malformations consortium, they have patients with well over a hundred of these on MRI. And, and these, this idea of, of the sporadic cases having a single solitary lesion and the inherited cases having multiple lesions is the same idea, epidemiological uh, sort of presentation of retinoblastoma that led Knudsen to propose the two hit model for tumor suppressor genes. So this is back in the 70s, but I'll just remind you about this, is that he, what he said was, okay, if you've already inherited a mutant copy of a gene, then you're halfway to getting both copies mutated and a somatic mutation in the remaining wild type allele would then seed the formation of, in this case, a retinoblastoma tumor. And in fact, fam familial cases have bilateral disease because they get them in multifoci in both eyes. Whereas if you don't have that case, you need two somatic mutations in the same cell. And if it's one in 10 to the eighth chance, then it's one in 10 to the eighth times one in 10 to the eighth, it's one in 10 to the 16th. It will happen, but if it happens in a person, it's gonna happen once, it'll be unilateral one eye. And so Newton proposed this idea. And of course, that's the retinoblastoma to hit idea. And so we said, this sounds like the same thing, except we're looking here, the familial cases, you get, you've already got one mutant copy, you, got, you get lots of lesions. 
this for sporadic cases, your brain is completely free somatically of any mutations. You need the somatic mutation in the same cell. That's very, very rare, but it will happen. But if it happens, it happens only once. So is this true? And so this is in the early days. This is sort of going back in history. So this is like, I call it caveman molecular biology. But we PCR amplified, we took families that were in the familial cases and we looked for that second hit. And, and this is Amy Akers, she, a grad student. She, she took lesions that were, had been resected from some of these familial cases and she did sequencing. And to make a long story short, she did it three times. She had to prove that it always showed up and she found mutations in the opposite allele. But I want to show you something of why we had to do single, essentially what we do now is in individual sequence, like next gen sequencing. We did it by, by cloning and sequencing. But here's the bulk lesion and the somatic mutation is there. If you sequence individual clones from that PCR product, you see that that sequence is a mixture of wild type and a four base deletion. And if you look really carefully, oh, you look at this little pull up here, maybe that's the, because the, Point is, is the mutation is, is in only a subset of the cells, a fraction of the cells. And you can see a few, you know, what percent here. And what Amy was able to show in this picture was that this was biallelic. In other words, that the germline mutation, this patient happened to have, um, the, 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 the germline mutation happens to be the common Hispanic mutation. There it is right there. And on the opposite allele is the four base deletion. So you've knocked out both copies in some cells. What cells, you might ask, and that's, that's what she showed next. We did laser capture microscopy. We tried to get the endothelial layer of some of these caverns on some of these pathology specimens. And it's in the, it's, it's obviously, and, and one of my colleagues always criticized me, that's not a single layer. And I'm like, yeah, probably not. But, you know, it's really hard to get that. But clearly it wasn't in the interstitial tissue. It was in, the, uh, it was in that endothelial layer, which we kind of assumed anyways. Okay. So. We've got this idea that we've got three genes. We've got this two hit mechanism that's leading to the formation of the actual lesion itself. But that story doesn't account for several other really important aspects of CCM pathogenesis. One is, is that even in the familial cases, the CCMs have variable severity. And you can look at this MR imaging image, and then here's this one humongous lesion. And often these are very aggressive and hemorrhagic. They're causing much of the neurological um, phenotype. And the neurosurgeon might have to go in and get that one because it's just causing too much problem. The other thing I wanna talk about is, is in the meanwhile, we and others have developed these um, models based on uh, putting flocks, you know, uh, lox P sites, and then just knocking out the gene and endothelial cells using, uh, in mice using you know, common tricks. And, and, and it works really well and you could get a huge, and here's in the cerebellum, you can get this huge lesion burden that you can see from the outside if you inject the uh, tamoxifen to, to, to activate the Cree recombinase. But if you do that in adulthood, you get no lesions. So there's the, what we surmised was that the CCMs, at least in these mouse models, are only developing in the first week because there's a lot of angiogenesis going on in the brain, especially in the hindbrain, which is where we see the lesions. So, so that two hit idea just doesn't quite fit the whole story because you, it seems that you need this angiogenic stimulus to get the lesions to form. So again, what converts some of these CCMs into this aggressive state? And again, here's, here's I, I like this particular picture. Here's a sporadic CCM, it's a solitary case, but it came to clinical presentation because it was an aggressive lesion that was causing problems and the neurosurgeon might've had to take it out. Here's a familial case, I showed you this picture before, but you don't see any of these as being horrible. And then here's a familial case with an incredibly large aggressive lesion. So what, what's going on here? So we think that this is due to the two hit model, but then why are these happening? Why does this one happen? And then why does this one happen in the midst of all these others? So, so what we started to think about was the fact that just like cancers, sometimes you need more than one somatic mutation to drive the cancer. And this is the famous Vogelgram for uh, you know, carcinoma, uh, Bert Vogelstein, you know, that, that you need an APC mutation and a RAS, and you have this you know, continual more and more aggressive uh, muta uh, uh, tumor on the basis of various kinds of mutations happening. Could, could the same thing be happening for vascular malformations? In other words, not only do you need to knock out both copies of the CCM gene, but you need something else to drive this guy to aggressive state. And, and the nowadays in the vascular malformation field, 
there's somatic mutations in all sorts of oncogenes, RAS and tech, and we were involved in this one and GNAQ and others. And so it, it, it makes sense that, that in some cases you just need this aggressive mutation to start the whole thing. So, but another clue came from, I wish I could move this. Another, it says a clue came from a mouse model study by Eileen Wren and Mark Kahn. What they noticed was, and again, this is trying to knock out the gene in adulthood. I've told you it doesn't happen. You don't see any lesions here, but if they injected a recombinant adenovirus with an activating PI3 kinase mutation, and this is involved, this activating, there are many, there are three or four common activating PI3 kinase mutations, but he would inject the adenovirus at a very specific point in the adult when they knocked out, and it's the same genotype here, he's knocked out all the genes, and you get this super aggressive lesion, and you can see here the, the statistics. So he said, ah, it's like a synergy between a loss of this like one growth suppressing gene and then an activation of this sort of growth enhancing gene. And so Dan Snelling's in my lab Well, we said, well, we'll check this out because we had by then collected many, many of these lesions. And sure enough, I'm gonna show you first down here. Some of these are familial cases and we could see, a, you know, there's all these color codes here, but the point is they have a, a germline mutation. Sometimes we found this somatic mutation, some of them, are sporadic, and so we found two somatic mutations, like here, here, where you see these asterisks. But then on top of that, in the lesions, we found these activating PI3 kinase mutations. Here's the three most common famous ones. You could just look in the cancer database. They're, they're the three most common PI3 kinase mutations in all, all of cancer, all sorts of cancers. And, and they were found in all genotypes, sporadic, unknown. Am I? No, okay. <laughs> it's the remote people, got, I got it. Oh, let's see. I don't want them uh, to... Uh, Disappear though. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so a couple. So, so the point is, is they weren't in brain arterial venous malformations. They were in the CCMs. They were in any of the three germline mutations, sporadic cases, etc. And if you look at the kinds of mutations we found, not only the three most common in cancer, but some of these others, they these are the PI3 kinase mutations in cancer. And, and this is the, if this is from the Cosmic Database, which is the catalog of somatic mutations in cancer. And you can see that the, these mutations fall along the same res, amino acid residues in the, in the protein. It's, it's, it's perfect correlation. And so these are activating mutations. In fact, all of these are known to be activating already. So what we see, what's weird though, is, is in some cases, like I want you to look at this second one right here. One, two, three somatic mutations and we're asking ourselves, did that actually really happen in the same cell? And people say, that can't possibly happen. No way. Well, the way to tell is to actually test it out. So, so oh, wait, first I forgot to tell you that the PI3 kinase uh, pathway, uh, PIK3CA is, uh, is, is this uh, is the active, active unit, subunit of PI3 kinase, and it's involved in a lot of downstream. It, it's sort of a central hub in, in receiving signal and then uh, growth pathways through AKT and other things. So um, back to what my narrative here. Could three somatic mutations happen in the same cell? When you look at bulk sequencing, you can say, well, what's the allele frequency of the mutant allele? And you know, it varies a little bit and you can't really tell. You really have to look at single individual cells. And what you're looking for is, is cells that have all the mutations in the same cell. And so that's kind of what we did. We actually, had to, these are frozen samples that we've archived uh, through the a biobank. And so they're frozen, so you can't get individual cells, but you can get individual nuclei if you don't know this. The nuclear membrane is much more robust to freeze-thaw than the um, cell membrane. And so we'd get these tissues, we'd homogenize it, we'd get single nuclei out, and then we used um, single nucleus sequencing. This is just to show you that we can put single nuclei in um, uh, micro droplets. Uh, it's part of the tapestry platform, which you can use in the genome core. And then we would do targeted sequencing. And I'm gonna show you this data here, but just look at this Venn diagram here. The great majority of individual nuclei in this case had all three mutations, okay? And I wanna sh show you this one too. It's the same for the familial form. Now, every nucleus had the germline mutation because this is a familial form, but I wanna show you something. There's 6,040 nuclei we sequenced and only 5,378 had the mutation. There's a phenomenon called allelic dropout when you do single nucleus or single cell anything, right? Because at the DNA level, there are exactly two copies of any sequence. 
the maternal and the paternal. And if one of them doesn't amplify very well in the first few cycles, it's over. You're only going to see one allele. That and, and there's a perfect case of it because unless Mendel was wrong, and I'm sure he's not, that, that every one of these had this. So we actually could calculate the dropout rate and it's about 8%. So these other nuclei that like six, eight here, oh, see those don't have both mutations. Well, that's a little dropout. And, and here's some data here and they're associated with pretty strong p-values. So these are all in the same cell. If we, these are p-values assuming that well, we were wrong and then the, I think they're all in the same nucleus. So um, yeah, so um, when we publish this, we noticed that somebody else then recently, at the same time almost, published that they found a few of the PI3 kinase mutations, but they found mutations in this other gene in some of those sporadic cases. And what we went back and noticed that this gene, MAP3K3, which is the gene encoding MEK, MEKK3, but let's call it MAP3K3, is associated with a very obscure venous malformation syndrome. And so sure enough, we went back and sequenced and you remember we were talking about the fact that we found some most of these aggressive lesions. They would we think we have a bias against getting the aggressive lesions with the PI3 kinase mutations because those are the ones the neurosurgeon is going to pull out, right? These, these are, in a familial case, they're only going to grab the one that's causing a problem. But we found and, and we're missing some mutations for various reasons. But what we found here was some of the missing ones that did not have a CCM mutation have a MAP3K3 mutation. And all down here is to show you that just some of these MAP3K3 also have a PI3 kinase mutation. And it's the same story. We did single nucleus DNA sequencing, and we showed that they were by far in the same cell with high, high P values, even minus 72, et cetera. Okay, so it's single nucleus confirms that this PI3 kinase mutation and the MAP3K3 are in the same thing. So here's what's going on. And I didn't talk a lot about the biochemistry. It's really quite complicated, but it, it appears this CCM complex, there are three genes, seems to be involved in a lot of different pathways. But one of the things that do is it inhibits this MEKK3. That's MAP3K3. So the idea is you can either knock out, you know, with, with two hits, this, the, the negative regulator, or you activate that. Oh, I didn't tell you that that's an activating mutation for MEK3K3, and you can get a CCM. But if you want an aggressive CCM, you've got to also activate the PI3 kinase pathway to really get that aggressive one. Okay, so one more point. It had been known a long time. I've been talking, our entry point into this whole story was these familial cases. But the sporadic cases are more common, but they're, like I said, they're, all, they're solitary lesions. But it had been known for a long time that the sporadic lesions often develop right adjacent to what's called a developmental venous anomaly. It's considered a benign vascular anomaly. And on this, this particular MRI, you see this almost like this palm tree-like appearance, we call it. These are very common. They've seen in about six to 14% of MRIs if you look at the literature, but about 24 to 32% of sporadic CCMs are associated with the DVA on MRI data, but 100% of the surgically resected aggressive CCMs, it may not be exactly 100%, but this is what my neurosurgery colleagues tell me, 100% of these aggressive ones are associated with a DVA. So we asked the question, does this PI3 kinase mutation cause the DVA? In other words, is this the precursor in these sporadic cases? We kept thinking that the CCM, I've told the story from a CCM-centric uh, sort of view, but maybe in these sporadic cases, these PI3 kinase mutations are. But the problem is we can't get a benign DVA. It's impossible to get. But we can get a DVA if it's associated with the CCM, if the neurosurgeon, while he's in there, gets a little piece of the CC of the DVA. So Sam Awad, my neurosurgery colleague at the University of Chicago, did this. And this is going to be, these are droplet digital PCR reactions. But all I'm going to, I'm going to just cut to the chase and not look at the numbers and don't worry about the data. The idea is in the CCM, in the lesion, you see the CCM mutation and you see the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the PI3 kinase mutation, but, and, and you see it in the DVA. But when you look, um, yeah, when you look at this, at the, at the uh, MAP3K3 here, the CCM has the um, MAP3K3 mutation, the DVA does not have the MAP3K3, but the DVA has the PI3 kinase mutation. So these, these were three samples that had MAP3K3 mutations and DVA. It was easier to do this with two mutations than three. And we could see that the, the PI3 kinase mutation is in the DVA, the same mutation. It's always the same mutation in these cases. 
and then the, the CCM has that same PA3 kinase mutation, and in this case, then the MAP3K3. So we think, this is now also published, sorry. Uh, we think that then that this, that the P, that this DVA, developmental venous anomaly, is an abnormal vascular growth sort of fueled by this PI3 kinase mutation, but it's benign, but now you created this sort of template for if you get a MAP3K3 or presumably two hits of a CCM mutation, you get the, the CCM and the aggressive one. So this is just that model. You can get a CCM loss of function mutations or a MAP3K3 gain of function that is activating. You get this quiescent CCM cases. But, in, but, but if you start with a DVA with the PI3 kinase mutation, then it can form on the, on the DVA. So I, don't, I think I haven't gone too long. So um, I just wanna acknowledge, um, these are all the people who did the work over the years. My clinical colleague, Asama Wad, and my sort of science colleague, Mark Khan at Penn. Um, and then um, the, 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 the current, a lot of the current single cell stuff was done by a really outstanding grad student who's now uh, left and is a po doing a postdoc in Boston, Dan Snellings, and, and our, and our uh, financial support. So I'll, I'll take questions. Okay. Now, I didn't. Questions? And if there are ones on the thing, I'll. Yeah, I'll monitor that for you. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, very good. Very good. So a couple things. One thing that stimulates growth, which is completely bizarre, is the microbiome. And so that's been shown. It was very, Mark Kahn, my clinical, uh, my science colleague noticed this. It's, it's a very cool story. But, but so bacterial lipopolysaccharide, whoops, um, uh, signals through the TL4 pathway and that sort of exacerbates because then it gets in the bloodstream and that exacerbates these. So that is an environmental influence. It's not in the parenchyma per se. And then what's definitely true is as these things grow and get more and more bloody and everything, there's a huge immune reaction and uh, infl inflammation and that has a lot to do with it. And then one more thing is the astrocytes nearby seem to be secreting VEGF and there's this like crosstalk. So, so, so I don't, they're not involved, like I think the initiate, like these things have to initiate by these genetic mechanisms, but their growth is fueled by secondary things. And, and, and the weirdest one, of course, is the microbiome because you, the, I, but I mean the microbiome, I mean the gut microbiome is, is doing the, uh, is doing the brain thing. Yeah, can we do a little like Jeopardy? And Jeopardy? Question? Oh, I'm sorry. The yeah, I'm sorry. And I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, are there any other uh, elements uh, in the parenchyma or uh, that, that stimulate the growth? And so we have the um, astrocytes, we have the microbiome creating lipopolysaccharide, which drives this. And um, I forgot what else. Oh, and then there's, a, and in the later stages, there's an immune reaction. And then they get very aggressive, yeah. All right. uh, I'll, I, I have a question, Doug. So we see a lot of MRIs with like one angioma or a dural, you know, a, a brain venous abnormality, not big, but so are you telling us every time we see those, there is a somatic mutation at work? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm biased, but I would say that yes. Oh, that's good. I, 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 and, and I think there, there, if you look at the literature, there's an explosion of these papers. And yeah, I think, I think all of these are seeded by somatic events in the same way that if you said, well, cancers don't have anything to do with genetic, yeah, of course they do. There's other aspects like the microbiome and everything. But I think tumor, I think these things are just abnormal vessel growth and they're seeded by somatic mutation events. So, um, and I'm waiting for another question. So I'll just do a Q and A. So I knew Daniele Rigamonti very well. Okay. <laughs> I, I was, he became the hydrocephalus guy after he burned out, chopping out aneurysms and venous malformations. Uh, and Leslie Morrison was a resident in my class oh, at really? Hopkins, yes. Oh a great lady, went to the University of New Mexico, right? right yeah, she's yeah. A, yeah she, she was the dean for a while, she just retired. She was a dean? She was the dean of the medical school. Holy today. cow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just impressed. Uh, so 
what's the difference? I mean, because we're, we're no geneticists, but can you explain the difference between a, how a germline mutation happens and how a somatic mutation, because a germline one happens, does that happen in an old egg or sperm or is that something that happens randomly? Whereas I assume these sporadic mutations are age related. Yeah, it might not actually. Yeah, so so the germline, I, a geneticist uses the term germline just to mean that it's passed on. So if you're asking when it happens in the sperm or the egg, yeah, it, it probably happens during replication early on and then it's set down. But when, I, when I'm saying germline, I'm just saying that, yeah, you know, just like any mutation of any inherited disease, it is now part of the germline, it will be passed down. But where, how it happened originally is in the sperm or the egg and during replication. The somatic events are almost certainly happening during replication. So it may be age related, but many of these things may be set down earlier when they're, you know, because the endothelium is a quies, pretty much a quiescent tissue. And so it may, some of these mutations may be sitting there a long time before they develop. I'm not saying that, that there's some, in, like in arterial venous malformations, which is a different you're, lesion. You're saying these come out when an endothelial cell divides. Yes, they, they, they would almost have to. The, the question is, is, um, is there anything about like late, like if there's any damage or this or that, can yeah, you, can you later in life stimulate? Yeah, them exactly. Right. Yeah, and th then that could be it. But they're just, they're just replication errors but they would happen in an endothelial cell as opposed to in the germ cells. So um, a remarkable thing. I, I mean, I think it, if I was young, which I'm not, I would be studying <laughs> brain endothelial cells because there are more of them in the brain than yes. there are glia or neurons probably yeah. put together. Yeah. And a lot. Over, over evolution, they've not only become stuff for transporting uh, blood, but they're also really important immune regulating cells. They probably secrete growth factors yeah. like nobody's business. They're, they could be the kings. And um, I, it's been a quiet field. But one of the things when I was younger, I was wondering, how long does a brain endothelial cell Ooh. last? Uh-huh. You got me there. And I, I think they must be now, pretty long because they're, they're very quiescent. The That's my other question. <laughs> Do they Stump the repopulate from stem cells floating in the blood or their neighborhood endothelial precursor? Oh gosh, yeah, developmental biology, huh? I, the second part of the question, I don't know where the, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that, that there's, you know, vas, the, the vascular plexus is set down very early in development and then, and then it remodels due to flow and everything. And that's how you set up endothelial cells and vein, uh, veins and arteries and capillaries. So I'm, 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 a, yeah, I'm talking about more than uh, when yeah. We need a new endothelial cell. Where yeah. I'm, I, I'm guessing that it comes from, from the, um, oh, oh, oh I, I should tell you this story because I did talk this about this in the, um, in the, the stroke conference. In a different disease, exactly the same genetic mechanism, germline mutation, somatic mutation, the patients get telangiectasias. This is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. When we sequence, all of the mutations, when we have multiple lesions in a patient and when we sequence, they all are a different mutations, different somatic mutations, same germline mutation, but you knock out the second allele in a different way. That would indicate that they're not coming from a stem cell that caught the mutation and then that, that they're all completely independent events in situ, like with a cell in there. But that's a different disease, but in the brain, no, no, you know, actually- the same thing about cardiac endothelial. So yeah. Where do they come from? Yeah. The neighborhood or something floating around? I'll tell you, in a, set, in a kind of a different way, we wanted to answer this and here's the problem. We would love, that patient with 100 lesions, we'd love to get all 100, but you're not going to ever do that and never. And we've struggled to even find a time when we've got two, oops, I'm doing, we, we struggled to find a time. Uh, two enthusiasts. Yeah. When we got two mutations, I'm sorry, two lesions from the same patient. We did get once we got a lesion from a patient. It was resected by a neurosurgeon. Many, many years later, it, it, it re reappeared. It, maybe it grew back. Maybe. And sure enough, they had pulled out again. They had the same mutation because it was probably a regrowth of the old. So the, the, he, they left behind some mutant tissue. Even if they didn't leave behind the, uh, the lesion, there were some mutant cells. So that, that, that we've published. But we've never gotten two or three or four from the same patient. And I don't think we ever will. Maybe on autopsy, but. But imagine an endothelial cell living 70 years. You think that's possible? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's, wow. It sounds unusual. Well, it how about neurons, happen. though? Yeah. No, well, I don't neurons, know. do we accept that? But we would assume something like an endothelial cell is constantly regenerating. I yeah. don't think it is. No, no. I mean, there's very, it's a very quiescent tissue. And um, that's why some people think that some of these things, you ask when they occur, some of these people think that the initial event may have happened during development. And, and you may, these things may be sitting there, the cells, and eventually developing and, and later on in life and growing. So anyway, uh, we tend to, in neurology going around, be a little more clinical. Okay. But, uh -oh. there's, there's, no, but there's still a great <laughs> world of fabulous biology, and genetics going on at Duke. And so I encourage all the young folks to explore it. You know, if you want to do research, the best research may not be in your own department. And, and you know, look around for all the different things that yeah. Duke has. And so I'd like to talk, thank Dr. Marchuk for a great job. Thank you. Congratulations. That's amazing stuff. Well, you know, what you said is true because I, I couldn't have done all this without, uh, I mean, I have like 30 papers.